Hello and good evening everyone. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to our MOOC this evening. We have Deloitte here to discuss tech roles to kickstart your career. My name is Jane and I will be your Code First Girls ambassador tonight. Um, I am one of the Code First Girls brand ambassadors, but I'm also one of their instructors. So if you have any questions about Code First Girls, upcoming classes or events, please do put your questions in the YouTube chat and I will try my best to answer them during the session or in the Q&A afterwards. From the Deloitte team will be uh, Anna Bellin, Hannah Willey, uh, Jessica Stewart and we also have Joe with us. So Anna is a senior software tester slash QE engineer at Deloitte Quality and Test Engineering Practice. She graduated from Bristol Uni in 2016 with a degree in economics and management and joined Deloitte as a graduate in tech consulting. Since then, Anna has worked on a few enterprise transformation programs in various industries and QE roles. Hannah is a senior consultant working as a cloud platform engineer on a large scale public sector project. She's been working in tech for about four years and came from a humanities background. She helps to run the partnership with Deloitte and Code First Girls because it's super important to see more female representation in tech. Jess is a consultant uh, working as a front end developer on a large scale public sector project. She came from a tech background and in the past two years has been focusing on web development as she's really passionate about making websites accessible for all abilities. Uh, we also have Jo who is a junior a talent lead who will be joining us to answer any questions if you want to know how to join Deloitte. A Code for Skills will also be running other MOOCs over the next couple of months so please have a look and sign up to a future MOOC. These sessions give you great insight into key technical languages or concepts or how to get into the, the industry in general. I will share all the links to the Code First Girl platform in the chat. We also have several career switcher classes coming this spring or summer. So if you're looking to springboard into a tech career, you can find out more in the link that I will share later on. So just to let you know that the YouTube video will be up for a week or two after the session. So if you want to rewatch any of the content, you can do so by visiting the same YouTube link. And without further ado, I am happy to welcome the team from Deloitte to come and talk about Kickstarter starting your career in tech. Hi everyone. I hope you can uh, see the screen and see us. Um, it's really nice to be hosting this event. I guess the main aim of it is to um, introduce some roles that perhaps you haven't heard of or that you're really interested in and then potentially give you a bit of information about joining Deloitte and what our lives are like as uh, platform engineers, quality engineers and front-end engineers. Um, Anna or Jess, is there anything you want to say before we kick off? No. <laughs> cool. So I guess um, to start with, we at Deloitte have partnered with Code First Girls uh, for about a year now, and we've onboarded around um, 15 people into our teams. And actually next week we have another 20 people joining um, from Code First Girls Nano Degree. So if you want any information about that, then feel free to contact me or put, um, put it in the chat. We'll also have Joe afterwards, who is our junior talent lead, who will be able to answer more questions than what I could um, about joining Deloitte if you were wanting to join um, from a graduate position or, or any of the other ways that there are to join, because there are quite a few. It's a big company. Um, so me, Jessica and Anna, we sit in systems engineering, which is part of um, the consulting, I guess, team in Deloitte. As, um, this means that we largely focus on technical projects, um, which roles um, ranges from private sector, public sector, um, financial sector, and can span a wide variety of tools, platforms, um, languages, roles, like as, as varied as you can possibly imagine. 
So that's probably one of the reasons that um, we went working consulting so that we can get a very broad view of all of the different um, industries, technologies, um, roles that are out there. I myself have been, um, as Jane said, in tech for about four years, but I did come from a, um, I studied English literature at university, so it was quite a big change. And in the course of my career, I've managed to, um, I guess, touch lots of different tech roles that we will be walking through today. So ranging from um, back end developer to quality engineer to platform engineer, I was even a scrum master um, for a small period of time. So hopefully we'll be able to give you some insight into those. Um, without further ado, I guess we'll kick off the presentation. Unless there's any questions, in which case put it in the chat. So I've done the quick intro, um, and then we're going to be talking about seven different tech roles. This is not um, all of them. There are, of course, many others that exist. Um, new ones pop up all the time as technology um, progresses. So perhaps roles that we're talking about today didn't exist five years ago, and there'll be a whole new bunch of roles in the coming five years. So definitely keep you on your toes. And then finally, we'll um, look at a small business case of how all of these roles interact when on a project. Um, lots of the roles are not siloed, so you will be working with so many different team members from diff across different backgrounds, which is one of the reasons why it makes it so, um, I guess, interesting. Um, so here is a mentee quiz um, to start with, just to get some views from you all. If you could go to menti.com on your phones or on your laptops and type in this code. Um, I don't know if it could be popped in the chat for people to click on. Cool, thank you, Jane. <laughs> okay, so then we should start seeing some um, answers coming through. This is more of like a brainstorm activity. What sorts of tech roles have you heard of in the past? Um, just to get gather a bit of an idea. Is it working? Just going to check on my own phone. Oh, yes, it is. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so we're seeing UX design, data science, front-end dev, web dev, um, UI designer, DevOps, full stack. Okay, so seeing some common themes, um, definitely people are more aware of the front end developer, back end developer, um, as well as UI UX. I'm quite surprised about UI and UX, um, just because that is also fairly new, but that's great. Tech lead, oh, that's an interesting one. Product design, cybersecurity engineer. <laughs> okay, I think that person, whoever typed cybersecurity engineer probably um, has a background in tech to know that. Um, cool, okay, so lots of different ideas. Um, we'll be going through some of these today, but not all of them, um, just because there are so many. Um, cool. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so the seven that we're going to be going through are front-end engineer, back-end engineer, platform engineer, solution architect, scrum master, business analyst, and quality engineer. So these are all, um, I guess, roles that me, Jess, and Anna interact with on a regular basis, day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's lots and lots of these roles at Deloitte and... Um, I guess our experience with them is probably why we've picked them today. But not to say that data scientists, um, UX designers, UI designers, product managers doesn't exist. Like, obviously, we have those as well. But we've just decided to spotlight these ones. Cool. So over to Jess, who's going to talk us through um, what a front end engineer does and also what it's like on a day to day basis in her life. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Jess and I've been a front-end developer at Deloitte for about two years now. Uh, the role of a front-end developer is usually taking user requirements and page designs and kind of translating them into the real thing. 
in the web pages, uh, front end designer or front end developers tend to work on the part of the website that users kind of see and interact with. Uh, as part of the role, we aim to give the user a great experience by making websites as accessible as possible because we want users with different abilities to be able to understand and navigate the web content. Um, this can include things like using clear fonts, making sure the pages can be navigated using tabs, and making sure screen readers work as well. Uh, we also have to think about the different ways that people are going to be accessing the website. So for, there's lots of different desktop types. There's Chrome, Internet Explorer. We have to worry about all those and different screen sizes. And also the range of different devices that can be used, so mobile, different mobile sizes and stuff. And as you can tell, there's, there's a lot of different types we have to take into consideration now. Uh, the main technologies you'll come across during front-end development are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML would be used for the page content, CSS would be used for styling, and JavaScript would be used for the actual logic of the page. So, for example, what happens behind the scenes when you click a button. Uh, front-end developers tend to use what we call JavaScript frameworks, um, which are a collection of code libraries. They tend to make our lives a whole lot easier. So. If you ever hear of people mentioning React and Vue and Angular, they would be the three most popular ones at the moment. Uh, other tools that we would use would be the typical kind of developer tools. So VS Code or Atom as a, an IDE, um, GitHub for version control. Um, or if you're like myself, I prefer a nice user interface. So I use something called Fork or Git Kraken, just something that makes it look a bit nicer. Uh, we also use things like JIRA to keep track of our tickets. Um, I think JIRA is pretty broad across all of the different stages. I think every one of us will have used JIRA um, to keep track of our progress on tickets. Uh, personally, for myself, how I became a dev was I joined Deloitte about three and a half years ago, and I did come from a tech background, but I kind of had no idea what area of development I wanted to go into. And if I'm truthful, I didn't really know even the difference between front and back end development. Um, or even I hadn't even heard of the term platform at this stage, to be completely honest. Uh, I also kind of had this misconception that front end developers had to be really arty and creative. Um, but from the Menti before, I can see that people are kind of separating those roles now that designer can be a completely separate role of the front end, which is good. Um, I'm not very good at the actual design of pages, but I like putting them together anyway. Um, so for me, I I was a uh, I've took on a load of different projects before I was a front end. I was using Python, I was using low code kind of softwares, and then I went on to a project where I was kind of just expected to pick up a lot of different roles when things were needed, and I started working on the front end with a the client was using Vue.js, so I used that for a few weeks and then following that got a bit of time to do some Udemy courses, picked up a bit more knowledge and then went on to an internal project for a couple of weeks. And then following that, I was moved on to my the project that I've been on ever since, which is a large public sector project using Vue.js. And I've been on that for the past year and a half now and haven't really looked back. So. Yeah, really enjoying being front end dev. Uh, my typical kind of day to day role, I, I would start the day with a morning stand up at half nine, where the team of developers, business analysts, testers, everybody kind of comes together and we give updates on our tickets. Again, probably going to be the same for every person who's speaking. We're all we all have stand ups, I would say. Um, this is usually led by our Scrum Master. Uh, we usually give updates of what was completed the day before, and more importantly, anything that's blocking any kind of future progress that could jeopardize our release going out. Um, following this, my day can be very different compared, depending on what I've got going on. So usually it is writing new kind of front-end code for new features. Um, it can also be, at the minute, when we don't have that many features planned, we can be doing tech debt tickets. So that's tickets where people people maybe don't see the progress, but we're actually improving the code base in the background. Um, so for example, at the minute we're converting some of our some of our code base to TypeScript to improve 
the kind of reliability of the code. Um, I also quite regularly pair a program with others in my team, um, especially on really difficult tickets because I find it it makes the whole experience a bit less stressful and it can actually be quite enjoyable um, with a lot of my colleagues. Um, and we also write a lot of unit tests as well. Um, we aim to have 80% of our code covered by unit tests. Uh, and then throughout the day, as other team members kind of work on tickets and put in pull requests, we do review each other's code. So everything, every piece of code that we write is reviewed and approved by multiple people. So you never have to worry if you're not sure about if a piece of code is good enough to go in because somebody will kindly tell you. Um, and then just in general, we have a lot of conversations throughout the day with back end developers, business analysts and stuff about maybe any issues that we're having with connecting our front end to the back end and just any kind of questions that we have on requirements that have maybe come through on a ticket. Um, so yeah, there are there's a lot of side conversations as well. Uh, what I like about being a front end dev, it's kind of the visual aspect of it. I feel like with front end development, you can kind of you see your progress straight away, which is something when I was working in the back end, I couldn't see so much. I'm quite a visual person, so I like making nice user interfaces and stuff. Um, I also find it really exciting how when things did go to production, it was just right there. Like I could point to a page and say, I did that. You know, I thought it was really cool. Um, and yeah, I find with front end development, there's always kind of lots of new technologies coming out. It's quite, there's, there's always just new JavaScript frameworks coming out. So there's always quite a large supportive community and all around those, both in Deloitte and outside of Deloitte as well. But I also, I think overall, the favorite thing about my role is just that I'm not, I'm never ever just straight coding all the time. It's always good. You get to speak to others and everything in your team. And I've got a, quite a good balance of the working on code, but working with others as well. Um, I will hand back to Hannah, if that's okay. Great, no, thanks Jess. I think that was a really good overview. Um, I guess if anyone has any questions for Jess, then um, feel free to ask at the end or Oh no, wait, you can't ask at the end. Jess is um, going to help on a Code First Girls web dev course. <laughs> so ask uh, now <laughs> if you need to um, in the comments. Great. So let's move on. Oh, sorry, I've ruined this now. <laughs> okay, sorry, we've done this. Okay, back to the Mentimeter. <laughs> there we go. Um, so the next question. Okay, here we go. What do you think a back end engineer does? I feel like um, back end engineer is probably one of the most known about roles in tech. So I think people might be quite spot on with answers here. does everything that happens behind the scenes of a web page, works on server-side code, coding in general. Yep, that's definitely right. Although I'm sure Jess would argue that lots of things behind the scenes of a web page are also done by a front-end developer. <laughs> um, works on the background, how it works, makes APIs, yep. Writing scripts. Yep. What Jess does with the coding, such binary side of things <laughs> like that. Um, builds the structure. And then there's one there, works on a database to make sure it works as planned. So definitely there's lots of aspects of what we've written here. Um, all of them are correct to a certain degree. I guess writing scripts, um, is a back-end role, but scripts would more be um, when you're automating something or um, lots of QA engineers write scripts um, and then building the structure. That's a, there's an argument that, that you could say that that's a platform engineer. Um, oh, here's another one, database APIs. Cool, yeah, I, I think everyone's got the 
like the right idea, which is great. Um, so I think I'll probably whiz through this one then. Um, a backend engineer writes code that passes between the front end and the server or the database. So it is lots of things that are going on behind the scenes that you won't necessarily see as a end user, but definitely very important, like storing data, um, passing data using APIs, um, I guess making sure that everything behind the scenes connects with the front end, that any data that passes through the front end comes back um, and is stored somewhere. That's kind of a backend role. Um, so languages like Python, Java, SQL, um, to interact with the database and the server. There's millions of, of different languages um, out there, functional and non-functional. Um, but and Ruby, Ruby's a really common one at the moment. I know there's um, Python courses with Code Pascal, so if you do want to learn more about Python, then definitely join one of those. Um, they work with product designers, architects, front-end engineers, essentially everybody, really. Um, lots of people have input into the the um, the the structure of the back end before it actually gets implemented. So it isn't the case that a back end developer is just kind of left by themselves to um, build something like there are lots of inputs um, from, let's say, architects, uh, testers, um, even Jess will have to interact with a lot of back end devs um, to make sure that things pass through properly. Um, there we go, integrating the user facing elements. Um, and then some of the tools, <laughs> not all of them, this is just like a fairly concise selection. Um, so nowadays, integrating with platforms like AWS, um, TypeScript um, is a coding language, just an example, using Postman to test and build your APIs, um, same as Swagger, we would use that for, um, GitHub to host your code and source control it, um, MongoDB as a um, database. Um, it's a fairly new type of database, but very popular. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, and then Jira to manage your tasks. Um, I think I see, oh, there's a question for front end dev, which I'm gonna interrupt back end dev and get Jess to answer just because she has to leave soon. <laughs> Is that okay, Jess? Yeah. Um, I was actually just typing out a reply with a link here that I was going to send, but um, I would say that the best way to kind of start learning any kind of web development and uh, online resources, definitely. Um, I was about to tag a Udemy course that has been highly recommended amongst our kind of front end group. It's called the Web Developer Bootcamp. Um, it's, it's, I think it's something like 20 quid at the minute, but if you don't want to do that, there's definitely loads of free resources as well. Um, the biggest thing I would say is to make sure you actually do the exercises and um, get some of the free software and stuff that you can use. Um, the best way I find to learn is to actually do the things and make your own little website and stuff. And then there's another question <laughs> from Dio as well. Cool, thank you. Oh, unless that's the same. Oh, yeah, sorry, I can see it now. Okay, it's a similar question, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, I, again, I would say the, the degree in fine art could be really helpful as well if you've got like an eye for kind of design and how things look and everything could be really helpful. Um, again, just having a look at online resources and just testing things out by yourself would be a great way to get started. There's also a um, Code First Girls web development course um, that's for eight weeks. Um, lots of different uh, companies help to run them, but Deloitte have one as well, if you ever wanted to join that. I think the web dev courses with Code First Girls are really, um, really useful. That's actually when I, um, that's one of the ways I first got into tech when I was at university, I did one of the Code First Girls um, web dev courses. So, cool. Okay, no more questions for Jess on the chat anyway, but feel free to keep adding them in. Cool, okay. Um, me. Um, so I've been a platform engineer for, I'd say about two and a half years now um, on, I guess, various different projects. Um, I 
spent quite a lot of time as a back-end engineer as well, or at least I did a combination of back-end and platform. Um, it's quite, platform is quite an interesting one because if you speak to any, if you speak to 10 different people, you're going to get 10 different answers of what a platform engineer does. Um, it's often confused with a DevOps engineer because there are certain things that are fairly related. Um, but I would say from my point of view, it is fairly distinct. Um, the a platform engineer, at least in modern times, like at the moment, there's lots of work going on with um, cloud as a cloud platform engineer, like it's a really, really growing industry. So I would almost like recommend exploring this, this role because, um, because it's so new, it's very in demand. And I think it's a really good place to start your career. Um, so what a platform engineer does, um, let me go through the slide a little bit. So it involves building systems that allow others to build on top of, such as application engineers. So platform engineers build the kind of base layer and then backend engineers can develop applications on top of that platform. Um, that's probably one of the best ways to put it anyway. Um, we support the transition of application infrastructure from development through to production. So there is an argument to say that that is a DevOps role, but it is often seen as a platform engineer role as well. We use infrastructure as code to create and manage large scale distributed systems in a safe and maintainable way. So infrastructure as code um, is a way of codifying every single part of the platform so that it can be rebuilt across multiple different environments at the same time with the same pipeline. Um, this means that instead of just having a production environment um, or a couple of environments, you can have as many as you want. And um, the, I guess, beauty of it is that it's all source controlled. So manual changes never, well, never need to happen. And there's much much fewer, I guess, bugs that come from um, pipelines, deploying things like with infrastructure as code, everything is in um, like one repository. Um, the infrastructure as code tools that you might have heard of or languages um, are Terraform is probably the most common one or there's another one called CloudFormation, which is um, AWS's own uh, infrastructure as code language. Um, the, the tools that we use, as I said, Terraform, um, something like Azure DevOps, um, which is for our pipelines and also to host our code, um, a visual like code visualization tool like Visual Studio, um, things like Ansible. Um, I put AWS there as that's an example, and that's what I personally work with all the time, but there are obviously many other cloud platform, um, cloud providers, and also obviously you can have on-premises. I personally have only ever worked in cloud, um, so that's, I can answer more questions about than if it's on-prem, but I can definitely try to answer your questions anyway. Um, I got into platform engineering by mistake almost. I was on a project where um, the platform team was really, really busy and I was looking to move into um, a technical role and the platform team needed the most help. So it made sense for me to move into that. I did eventually end up spending about half my time um, in the platform team and half as a backend developer. But to be honest, um, it was really helpful to see end to end because what I was building as a backend developer, I would then build the infrastructure um, that it sits on top of. So I really enjoyed that and then had a few other back end roles and ended up coming back to platform. I personally really like it because it's such a modern, um, modern technology that it's changing all the time. So it feels like no matter how much you know now in two months time, there's going to be new features out. There's going to be um, new tools, new ways of working, um, new best practices in the industry. History. So it's really like exciting and interesting role to have. Um, it's obviously has to be tailored to every single project. So one implementation of your of your um, platform is is never gonna is not necessarily gonna work for another project. Um, trying to think what else um, I can say about being a platform engineer. So my day to day is um, fairly 
uh, it changes a lot because uh, like Jess said, I start with a um, daily scrum. I have tickets that I'll be working on, like building certain um, services with cloud. If any major incidents come in in production, then I will help to triage them, investigate what's wrong, and then fix them. Um, so that's often very exciting, but sometimes stressful. Um, but it does mean that you get into the thick of it and you work with lots of different team members. So I'd say working on production incidents isn't necessarily um, very common. As a platform engineer, it does exist, but I've kind of specialized into, into focusing a lot of my time on production rather than um, upstream. That doesn't mean to say I don't code, like I, I still do. Um, but nowadays I spend quite a lot of time helping with any incidents that come in because I'm on a very large project. Um, apart from that, we use Jira um, to track everything. That's fairly standard. Um, we are very interested in monitoring and alerting in platform engineering because we need to know at any point in time what how everything's performing and if something's gone wrong. We almost need to know that something's gone wrong before it has gone wrong. So if there's any almost like signs that something is erroring um, before it becomes like a huge problem for our end users. So um, monitoring and alerting is a fairly big uh, topic as well in platform engineering. Um, if you want to get into being a platform engineer, I'd say a really good place to start is learning um, things to do with cloud. So picking a specific cloud provider and understanding the use cases for it, um, some of the different services, uh, how to build, how those services are built, and taking some of these certifications that these cloud providers offer. There's many out there, um, and then. As Jess said, Udemy courses are always going to be good. There's lots and lots that will teach you Terraform and um, doing it yourself on your on your own machine is always going to help instead of just watching videos. Cool. Any questions before I move on? Nope. Cool. <laughs> okay, Solution Architect. I'm going to whiz through this one because I don't personally have experience as a solution architect. And it's also typically a role that is for um, more senior people when they've gone through their career as a back end developer. Um, so a solution architect is someone that has lots of experience with being a developer and then can translate code into designs. So they will take um, I guess, product requirements and put make them into diagrams so that they can then be referenced from um, backend developers or platform developers even. They have a very, very important role in establishing quality across the system. Um, they, they have almost like a bird's eye view. Um, so they're responsible for evaluating all org the organization's business needs and determining how IT can support those needs. They identify technology solutions to meet the business requirements. They describe the structure, characteristics, and behavior of those software to project stakeholders. They're often <laughs> with diagrams, um, and they're typically someone with many years' experience. Um, I'd say having a really good uh, solution architect or a team of solution architects on your team is always going to be um, helpful. Cool, business analysts. Um, so we did have um, a lady that was going to present on business analysis, but sadly she caught COVID. Um, so I will do my best. So a business analyst is a role within tech that doesn't involve any coding. So it's someone that wants to understand how technology works, but not necessarily wants to like build the things themselves. They do um, interact a lot with backend and frontend um, developers because they do something we call BAQA. So business analysis, quality assurance, um, and I can probably talk more about quality assurance after, but um, a business analyst definitely focuses on the business side of the requirements rather than the technical side. You can have technical business analysts, so actually that statement's slightly wrong. Um, you can be a normal business analyst or a technical business analyst. Um, they deliver gap analysis against current solution and proposed solution. They write out the requirements for all of the features, um, often called acceptance criteria. Um, once those requirements have been built, that's when they do the AQA. 
And then they spend a lot of their time doing, I guess, research into what those requirements should be. I think it's a really interesting role in that you do get to work with so many different people that are doing very different things to yourself. So the amount of interaction you have with um, back-end devs, front-end devs, testers, um, platform people, like it's very, very broad. And I think that's why a lot of BAs like the role because they feel like they can get a taste for the technical side of things, but don't actually have to build anything themselves. It does require like really good communication skills to be fair. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, tools that they'll use, Miro, Jira, Postman, um, Swagger. I guess Postman and Swagger would be more be for um, making sure that things have been built properly or to the specifications that they had wanted. Scrum Master. Um, so Scrum Master. Oh no, my door went. It's fine. Um, Scrum Master, I find is a really funny name. And when I first joined tech, I... Okay, so, uh, my fat mate's got the door. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so Scrum Master has a really funny name. And when I joined tech, I didn't really understand what Scrum Master was and just thought it was a bit weird. But really what they do is they follow agile principles like to a T and they're the ones that ensure that the team is working, I guess, um, with a good cadence, making sure that I guess everyone's supported, um, that everything is being delivered like to timelines. Um, they're, I guess the, the thing about a scrum master is technically they're not a team lead, but in reality, lots of times a scrum master is upholding agile principles, but is also running the team. So that's also, people might disagree with me on this call, but in general, how I've seen scrum masters work would be um, making sure that the team is delivering um, really high quality work and assigning work out. Um, yeah, so identifying issues that slow down the project and setting up plans to mitigate them. So very like team focused skills. Um, there's a there's a really good certification out there called um, Certified Scrum Master, um, which if if this career is something that you would like to do, then would really recommend it. I think it's only two days. I don't think it's too expensive. And there's definitely like really good online resources if you wanted to sit there. Cool. Okay. Over to Anna. Hi, everyone. It's finally my turn. Um, so I worked in testing for many years. Uh, it's actually called quality engineering now. Uh, it used to be called software testing, and I'm still confused because <laughs> um, I call myself software tester, but I'm actually a quality engineer. Um, so I'll start first by explaining what we do, and I think that's very important because a lot of people don't really know what testers do. And when I joined Deloitte uh, five years ago as a grad, um, I've been assigned to testing. It wasn't my choice. Um, but that was not a day when I regretted it. I absolutely love my job. and uh, um, But I joined in completely not knowing what testing was about. I, was, I knew that my assignment was testing practice, but I didn't know what testing meant. And I went through a whole induction process, becoming a technology analyst, but not knowing what actually I'm going to be doing. Um, but the job is actually uh, really interesting. And our main goal um, is to make sure that before the solution reaches the production, it's at its best quality it can be, that all the defects are found and fixed, um, that user experience requirements have been delivered, all the backend um, solutions have been delivered, everything integrates properly, everything works as it was uh, in plan uh, by solution architects and BAs, so, and also business owners. So we kind of connect a lot of people together and make sure physically almost that things work as they expected to. So we start from uh, doing an assessment of everything that everyone else done before. Not assessment as such, but we participate in what they're doing. We are reviewing the designs. Uh, we are attending the meetings that BAs and business owners do just so we have understanding and feel for the solution that is going to be built. Um after that, um, 
we start designing uh, task plans and task scenarios uh, that will cover all of the variations of passes that user can take. Um, and that way we test all the functionalities that were intended for the software or a website. Um, at this time, we also select the tooling that is important for automation testing. Um, the testing job in general can be divided on two types of testers. So it's manual testing and automation testing. I'm personally a manual tester, uh, but um, you could choose pass in whichever you are more excited about. Uh, manual testers do probably more groundwork. So um, we usually would couple up with uh, automation testers and um, I would do all of the analysis and design the task script and the scenario while the uh, automation test engineer will pick up the scenarios and test scripts that I've designed and then automate them. And uh, uh, automation of the test scenarios helps um, to ensure the quality of the software every time new code is added um, to the overall solution, right? Because every time you add something new, you can break something that is already there working. So. Uh, automation testers design those repetitive cycles where the code checks that things still work as expected, because if we were to do, do it manually, it would take ages and ages retesting everything every time something new is in. Um, so once we designed all the task plans and uh, test scenarios, uh, automation testers will come up uh, with automation um, test framework and put together loads and loads of um, tools together to produce. So they're basically developers in their own um, dedication. They, they, they just work uh, on designing automated test scripts. And in a lot of cases, if there are manual testings that, that testers that are not available, automation testers will pick up uh, the groundwork as well because um, they all usually come in from the background of, of standard testing, so to say. So uh, from manual perspective and probably overall testing perspective, there are a list of tools that we would use um, to, to record our task plans and uh, task scripts. And those will include Jira and um, Azure DevOps and ALM. Um, while the automation testers will utilize just ungodly amount of different tools. Um, but some of the famous one you probably will know about is Selenium, uh, Cucumber and Jenkins. So they're fairly standard in a lot of uh, automation frameworks. So once um, all the groundwork is done among the whole team, we start doing execution. So as a manual tester, uh, I basically pretend to be a user. Uh, if it's a front end, for example, and I have a scenario where um, someone needs to log in into their account and make a purchase. So I'll create a fake account and I'm going to go in and purchase something. Uh, and then it extends obviously further uh, from the front user because I'll also check, for example, integration testing. So not only will I check that I can place the order, I can check that in the database, the new order um have been have been processed and recorded um and uh, it'd been passed to the database correctly uh, and all the calculations are done correctly on the price for example on the shipping um so if we encounter any issues we will raise a, a defect or uh, a bug and then um work with the developers to resolve those um and uh, um, hopefully by the end of the whole process, um, we'll have as clean of solution as possible. Um, so, and the last stage uh, of our job, so to say, is reporting uh, on what we've done in a whole test cycle. So uh, we would collect all the test results, all the defects um, and present it in the documentation to make very wide range of stakeholders like business owners, uh, project managers, uh, dev leads, uh, et cetera, solution architects, uh, to, to explain to them what work has been carried out, what findings did we find, what have been fixed, how many defects have been fixed, uh, what are the areas of the solution we think was the riskiest and where developers need to pay more attention in the future. Um, 
So it's a it's a very interesting job in a way that you have to do a lot of different things, uh, which seem kind of um, you don't just code, right? Uh, you do something from what BA does. You do uh, something from uh, what solution architect does. You do something from developer's job. Um, and then you bring it all together, even project manager, basically, because we do the task planning and uh, completion reports. Uh, the skills vary completely um, on the project, uh, on the grade, uh, on automation and manual. But the most important things, in my opinion, is communication skills and attention to detail. Um, the more you can notice on the screen uh, or in the database, um, the, 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 the better it is, basically, because you can find more defects. Uh, and communicating about those defects to other developers is extremely important and sometimes fairly sensitive as well because we are giving feedback almost to, to, to people around their work. And we look at it um, in, in such a great detail and then and then try to communicate what's wrong with it. So uh, it's a bit sensitive, so it requires definitely very good communication skills. Uh, and if you are wanting to go into uh, programming side of things uh, and do automation testing, uh, it's uh, uh, all the languages that are relevant to the current project. Uh, I think quite a few automation testers will have a variety of languages that they would use depending on a project. And it could be Java, could be Python, uh, could be JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, anything. Um, but obviously, whichever you have, you'll be able to find uh, a job with that skill if you train up in it. Um, so from personal perspective, um, as I said, I, I've been I've been on some very big projects doing a lot of quality assurance. Uh, some of them meant completely lifting up um, what a huge bank does and replacing it with a new system. And it has to work to, to the very finite specification. Uh, not for, only for employees, but also for the front end users and the customers of that bank. And it's uh, uh, extremely satisfying when you find the defects um, and fix them and bring the solution to the point where it's flawless, uh, because you kind of feel really good that it's you who found it and the person won't need to experience the stress of finding that defect in the solution at the end. Because when I was doing uh, some of the banking um, stuff, it, it, you think if some if I don't find this defect in a checking system, I know that the person might try to withdraw something from their account and never receive their check. And then they will have to go through all the frustration of calling the bank and finding out where they check, looking for it. And it costs so much energy to, to deal with it. So it makes me very happy that what, what we do at the end is find those little issues that make people happy at the end. Um, and also amazing part of the job is that you talk to so many people. Um, so as Hannah mentioned about BAs, testers are very similar in that way. Uh, on my day-to-day -day job, I talk to at least three or four BAs because I manage uh, multiple uh, pieces of testing. Uh, I talk to three or four developers. Uh, I'm going to talk to solution architects, project managers, and obviously the product owners who are actually responsible for uh, their paying guys, you know, so... Um, and you, you have to communicate with them about what you are doing and uh, what are the results and what's the progress. And um, the final thing I think that the best part about this job is um, I, I compared it recently with uh, uh, ice cream shop. Um, as many as there are technologies in this industry, as many uh, testing flavors there is as well, uh, whatever you fancy doing, you will find it in testing. Um, and you don't have to develop as well. That's the point. You don't have to be an automation engineer. You can be a manual tester like I am and just play around with all with tax that you might feel excited about. So my personal passion was artificial intelligence. And I thought, well, this is really something I want to do and know how it works. And I wanted to be one of the first people who would test general general AI and like, you know, all the human machines and how do you how do you test that stuff? So I decided to specialize in AI testing. 
and went into that industry. Um, but other people go with cloud testing, database testing, data testing, uh, specific industries, maybe banking, maybe public sector, uh, whatever your um, soul calls you to, I would say. Um, but I, I think it's a great job. And I, I think it's, it doesn't get probably enough of the light sometimes uh, when talking tax. So uh, it was really nice to talk about it today for a bit. So if you have any, any questions, uh, please ask them as well. Happy to answer anything. I'll pass back to Hannah. Thanks, Hannah. Um, that was really good. I feel like we should probably have questions at the end now. <laughs> There's so many in the chat. Um, so, but yeah, thank you. Ah, oh, cool. Okay, so we are right at the end of the presentation. So I just wanted to show in a, I guess, visual form how all of these roles interact. Um, I think potentially traditionally people might have thought that if you were a back-end engineer or a front-end engineer or a BA or whatever it may be that you did your job and that was that but the fun thing about I guess working in in tech teams which mostly work in agile in, in like an agile way um I know someone's asked what agile principles are so I'll explain that after um but yeah the fun thing is you can work with so many different people and see so many different things so sometimes you from working with someone you might actually realize I would like to do their job and it's a fairly easy transition um because you can shadow them, you can ask for help, you can, um, I guess, get resources from them, all that sort of thing. But anyways, so our business case is going to be how to add a contact form to a website. So I, I did, I got like a tiny little uh, example of what a contact form could look like in the right hand corner. So your business analyst would define the requirements of the contact form. Um, your solution architect would specify the technical requirements and create system diagrams for others to refer to. Um, a front-end engineer would then build the front-end elements based off the user, based off the designs. A back-end engineer would build the server logic and methods associated with the form. Um, a platform engineer would then build the underlying platform to host the, the website or to host this form and deploy the code. A quality engineer would then validate that the form is built um, to specifications in bug-free. And a scrum master would be managing or overseeing the end to end process and coordinating the team with agile methodologies. So even though this is all in a circle, like, I guess I should have um, displayed it in a way where it's kind of like lots of lines going everywhere because you end up, it doesn't all happen in, in order almost like sometimes um, you'll end up like a front-end engineer and a back-end engineer will work together and maybe the back-end elements are built before the front-end elements or something like that. Um, so I wouldn't say it's like linear, but the point I'm trying to get across here is that everyone works together and it's a really, I guess, exciting industry to be in. Cool, final mentee. <laughs> Which role do you find most interesting? I guess I'm interested to see. <laughs> Almost a drum roll. <laughs> Assuming it works. <laughs> okay, we've so far got a fair mix. Okay, business analyst. Yeah, that's, um, I think, Traditionally, people always thought you had to develop or be a like write code to be in tech, but really that's not a requirement anymore. I think there's always a requirement to have a, a decent understanding of what is involved in writing code or hosting system. But apart from that, really anyone can come into tech. Like it, you don't need to have studied software engineering. Cool. Okay, front end engineer is winning. Scrum Master's coming. Scrum Master is really good if you really like organization and you really like being like a team lead almost and um, dealing with lots of quite high stakeholders um, because you, I guess, are responsible for the team. Solution Architect, I feel, is a good one further on in your career. Um, but again, it has a lot of responsibility because if, <laughs> if you design the system wrong and it gets built wrong, then ultimately it is a bit your fault. Um, 
Cool. Front end engineer does seem to be the winner. Um, I will message Jess. Oh, well, I know the name of, of the of the web developer course anyway. Um, it's called the Web Developer Bootcamp on Udemy. It will have, I'll find the link after and I'll send it to Jane. Um, but it will have thousands and thousands of reviews. I think it's the Ultimate Web Developer Bootcamp. Um, cool. Okay, I guess we can probably answer some of the questions in the chat now. Absolutely. Um, Thank you very, very Jane. much for uh, your uh, presentation. Very useful to talk about some of the roles that people maybe haven't heard of and you're quite difficult to get an impression of in Google. I don't know if Joe, if you would like Joe to join us for this section and we can just do a whole Q&A. So welcome Joe. Uh, thank you for Hi, everyone. I will try to ask the questions in as much of a, a logical way as possible, unless you want to start with tech questions. How would you like to go? However you would like. Super. So I think following on from uh, Jess's uh, what she was saying earlier about how to get started if you don't come from a tech background. And um, we have one here saying, how do you go about landing a role in tech once you've completed the, co the courses? How do you go about getting hands-on experience? And you can maybe even extend this to how can you do this and join Deloitte as well? Um, so that's a fairly hard question to answer because it depends which role you want um, as to how you're going to go about preparing for it. So as a, I guess, an engineer back end and front end um you would go about it as jess said doing courses um building things by yourself and then i guess trying to find an entry level position there are courses out there like um code first girls makers academy um that offer i guess career transition routes um some of them are fairly expensive other, others are free but that route is always a possibility. Um, if you wanted to be a business analyst or scrum master um, or quality engineer, I would say getting some really good certifications under your belt. So the scrum master, there's there's quite a few agile um, certifications out there from um, a, like a company called Prince Two, I think. Um, and then there's also a quality, um, wait, Anna, I've definitely done this certification. What's it called? The, the, um, the testing one, ISTQB, that's what it's called. Um, ISTQB, so write that one down, um, which are really good ways to learn about what software testing is, um, also what agile is, how we can work nowadays, um, starting by reaching out i mean attending these sorts of things is already really good so adding people on linkedin attending networking events um tailoring your to showcase the skills that are required for that job so anna was saying that to be a quality engineer you have to be very communicative and very um, detail oriented so that is probably something that you'd want to highlight as well as um i guess maybe any learnings that you've done courses certifications um, there are lots of companies that take you from entry level and train you up to be these, to have a role in these, um, to have a quality engineer role, um, scrum master business analyst. So like Deloitte, at Deloitte, we do that, for example, our graduates are not expected to come in really with any prior skills. We train them up um, along the way. Uh, and then I guess, Solution architect, you can't really train to be a solution architect. It kind of happens along the way, I think. Um, so I won't answer that one. Platform engineer, trying things out yourself on your local machine, doing some Udemy courses, um, looking into the most popular tools, Terraform, having a really good understanding of cloud, because that is where a lot of jobs are nowadays, um, would put you in a really good place. I think it's harder to try out platform by yourself compared to front end or back end, like at home. But that being said, because it is such a growing job, there are lots of vacancies. So lots of graduate programs or entry level jobs would be offering that role. Um, and if you say that you've got, oh, I've done this entry, like I've done this basic AWS certification, I've done a 12 hour course on Terraform, I've built this by myself, like that's already showing that you are 
very proactive because it is quite a niche um, job. Did that answer? <laughs> Hope that answered. Yes, I think you gave uh, all the information that might be required. Would anyone else like to add to that based on their experience and getting their role if they've not necessarily come from a tech background? I suppose my, my only addition really would be, and, and it does focus on that, that idea of like applying for entry level roles. I would absolutely recommend like every role we've talked about this evening, Deloitte offer, and you can get to one of those roles via our our, our one of our junior talent pathways whether that's you know as a as a, as a graduate or not um and all of the certificates and certifications that we talked about they're actually not prerequisites so i think quite a few of us haven't come like i know and uh, certainly hasn't um hannah and i and myself i don't think any of us have come from really technical backgrounds like i did economics at university so you really don't need much of a you don't need those tech requirements as prerequisites to apply um and certainly if you go if you if, if, if you just google deloitte and then go onto our early careers website you can have a browse through the roles and kind of the, we call them analyst personas um that you that, that we offer um and you can just apply by that um and kind of the actual recruitment process is it is not that elongated fair anymore they've streamlined it to an extent so it's one online application form um which isn't overly strenuous anymore um you have um one assessment day which involves a group exercise um a solo topic presentation then a final round interview in one day um and that's it really um and then yeah the the cup sky's the limit after that point um and frankly all of the qualifications we talked about so things like istqb um from the test perspective all the AD, aws cloud um training etc will pay for you to go and do that once you've joined um so you'll gain the qualifications and the experience as you work towards these types of roles um in whatever various various pathway you take um so yeah that would probably be you know i think applying would be my 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 go to uh, action to be honest absolutely can I, can I also add i think that you shouldn't be afraid to apply whatever your background is we have absolutely immensely diverse background in in a lot of those roles we have people who um, worked in retail, who worked uh, in circus out of everything, and um, Apple, um, genius engineers, uh, uh, all, all sorts, um, and everyone is welcome. And moreover, different perspectives are also very welcomed because something that you have done in your life might be a unique selling point for you specifically on some of our um, very specific projects with very specific clients. So something uh, that you think might be not important can be actually uh, very, very, very useful for your future team. Absolutely, all very, very useful answers. A good insight as well. I think a lot of us look at a job application and go, oh, we must tick all the boxes, but it's definitely not the case. So I hope everyone takes away what these three are saying because it's very important. Hannah, you mentioned a little bit more on networking. We do have a question just asking for any tips on networking and maybe what things to highlight in your CV or how to structure a CV to highlight what you've done. Um, so I'm going to say for this that I can give you my point of view, but there will be so many um, examples online from people that are applying for jobs really regularly. I had a CV that I joined Deloitte with four years ago, and I haven't really had to update it since. Um, so although I do, I guess, see CVs quite regularly, I wouldn't say that I'm the best person to ask. Um, I think for me, when you look at a CV, the important thing is to see that someone has experience using the skills that they are saying that they have so not just bullet point listing a okay i'm communicative i'm um detail oriented i'm um i'm a i know java like give us some examples of how you how you've how you can demonstrate those things um also not overwhelming your cv with like every single technology that exists like it isn't that likely that you're going to know 10 different programming languages you might have touched upon them but really what we care about is what 
skill level did you get to probably with one programming language? Because if you know one, then you can most likely switch and adapt around. Um, so trying not to get too, um, I guess, obsessed with putting 100 different tools and technologies you've used. Um, for applying for Deloitte, we I don't think we accept CVs anymore anyway. Um, Joe can keep me honest on that. Um, do we still? Yeah, no CVs. <laughs> Um, so that no, be... we don't. So it's it's all just um, information that you provide you in the online application form. Yeah. So I think that's a much more modern way to look at it. Just because if someone doesn't have, if someone hasn't been to a specific university or done a specific degree or have specific experience, like it's more um, diverse to have lots of questions that people can answer on their own terms. Um, yeah. Excellent. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Because I do have another question following along some lines, just saying, do you have any advice for attaining a placement or internship at Deloitte in data science or any other tech role? Um, I mean, not really like above kind of what I've already said. I mean, the, the key is to, to, to just get your application in. Um, I think kind of what Hannah's points around the, the t CV tips are, are really really good ones in that and again it's not so much about cv but how you how you how you um fill in the online application as i said it's you know we, we don't really have the prerequisites that you must have this technology experience or that xyz so it's really about it's really about apply, trying to apply your real world experiences whatever that may be on the work you have done to now or the experience you've had in your life in a way that can then demonstrate the types of qualities that we're looking for, namely things like communication, attention to detail, ability to work in a team, ability to drive things forwards. And that doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be from a job you've had, it can be from experience you've had in life or, you know, from school, et cetera. Um, so I suppose it, it, it's it's trying to uh, represent those experiences in a way that, that proves those skills rather than be able to say, oh, I've got, expert level of knowledge in C sharp or something. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't stress about that. And then I suppose just for the latter stages, so post kind of the online interview, um, it's a bit cliche, but really just trying to be yourself throughout those kind of group exercises um, and solo presentations is, is kind of the key. Uh, I think of the group exercise, um, make sure you are heard and you give your opinion. Um, you are there being compared to others so you do need to stand up and, and and be be counted that's not to say that you have to be the person like dominating and leading the group that's not that's not really the point but you must you know you, you're there to again and it, it's again it's similar to the way you need to represent your answers on online applications about showing an aptitude for some of those skills like communication and working with others and dealing with conflict for example um and 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 equally, you know, with the with the one-on-one -on -one interview, um, I think just trying to relax is probably the main thing. Um, you don't want to get in kind of your own way. Um, the interviewer is not there to trip you up; they're there to kind of find out, you know, who you are and how you operate. Um, so you really just want to try and let that shine through, um, rather than kind of like, yeah, yeah, getting letting the, uh, I suppose. Um, letting the interview get the best of you if that makes sense absolutely because you are all people at the end of the day so it also all comes down to a conversation and do you click or not so super advice there and um, that's a bit similar but maybe the other side of it someone's asking what the initial tech assessments are like i don't know if any of you can draw from your own experience what the tech assessments would be. i think it depends if we're talking entry level or um experienced um entry level there's no tech assessments um but if you do have experience and you're coming in as an experienced backend developer platform developer um solution architect it would depend on the role that you are coming in for um for backend and front end we often give a um an activity to do to see how you perform um but that being said, I know it's adapted and changed all the time. So I don't want to give you a certain number of days of how long it takes because I can't, I don't know what the the one is at the moment. Um, but sometimes we 
just do so if you wanted to be a business analyst or a sweet fan architect or you were coming in as a scrum master it would be more of a um a few interviews of more conversation like or demonstrating with whiteboarding or giving a scenario um based thing rather than so it depends if you want to be if you come in as a developer you'll probably be doing a um an evening test or um and then walking through it with an interviewer the next day but if you're coming in into a different role it's probably more likely to be whiteboarding um or more talking through your experience depends <laughs> okay we do have another question here saying do you have to be recently graduated to apply for the graduate stream with delight no so when i say graduate yeah when i say grad job i mean um it's just a, a grad, graduate level job i think is probably the more appropriate way to say it so it's, a, it's an entry level job i think you don't have to be a recent graduate no. super hey, thank you very much for that we do have a bunch of um technical questions based on your presentation so i will now share it then with you so the first one i'm seeing here is there Helen is not 100% sure what the platform engineer means. Would you be able to give an example of a project you might work on and your role in it? Yep. Um, so a, I'll give you from my perspective, like what I do on my, in my role. Um, I work with um, Amazon Web Services, so um, probably one of the largest cloud providers. And what my job is to do, what my job to do is, is to write um, Terraform code, which is infrastructure as code. Um, to build these services that are required for the um, front-end developers and back-end developers to build upon. So, for example, I will be building the layer that will um, host the back-end code in. So we use something called Lambdas within AWS, um, which are small um, servers, EC2 instances in themselves. Um, that are triggered based on a certain event and that code will run and then do something else. But what my job is, is to build the, the I guess, underlying platform. Um, another thing that I'm trying to think of examples. Oh, so also um, a big part of a platform developer role is um, making sure that things are secure. So making sure that our API gateway layer um, is secure so that we can't have um, cyber attacks and that we have um, web application firewalls and um, I'm trying to think of some good examples of things that we would build. Um, all of the permissions, so for example, we would want one um, piece of backend code, like one application might only be able to talk to another application and not to everything because that would be I guess, dangerous if there was ever a cyber attack. We want everything to have um, a small level of responsibility. Um, there's also a part of the job that is to do with making sure that all teams can build upon your platform. So not just in production, but also in all the other environments. So it's building a pipeline to deploy the code to all of the different environments safely and efficiently and quickly. And um, some pipelines I have seen in the past take like eight hours, but that's not technically our job. We should be making it fast and quick. Um, some of it could be more um, design meetings, like making sure that, so technical design meetings, um, making sure that we know exactly what we need to build to support the front end and back end teams. Um, yeah, those are the examples. So I'd say my bread and butter is using Terraform with AWS. Um, but that's not to say that that's what all platform developers do. Um, there's lots of other technologies and it's very different if you're working not on cloud, but as I said, I'm specialized in cloud. Um, it's, I've mentioned AWS, but to be honest, um, it would be very similar if I was using GCP or um, another cloud provider. So that part of it doesn't really make a difference. Um, yeah, you're basically building the system and then back-end developers write the code to sit on the system and front-end developers write the code for the front-end that sends data to the system via the back-end. I might have confused everyone. I'm very sorry. 
No, thank you very much for that answer. I hope that clears that up. If not, please ask more questions in the chat and we'll get right to them. Uh, someone else is asking, what are Agile principles? Um, Joe or Anna, do you guys want to take that one? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't get too bogged down in that right now. Um, so Agile is simply a, a methodology uh, that we regularly use to deliver programs. So it's kind of the way we go about delivering the work that we need to do. There are loads of different Agile methodologies. So depending on which one you're working with, you might have a different set of Agile principles. Um, there is kind of a, an umbrella agile manifesto that has kind of four key principles and there's things like um it's like working software over like detailed um documentation and things like that you can go if you google agile principles they'll pop up um but again it's the sort of thing you will learn to be honest if you were to join um one of our pathways you would almost certainly be in fact i'm currently planning um persona training for some of our joiners that are coming in at the end of this month and they will go on an agile 101 course and learn all about the agile principles um but yeah i think as a, as a high level definition they're just a set of values that help define um methodologies that we then might apply to the way we deliver a program is um using you've probably all heard of like stand-ups and maybe retros and um kanban boards using Jira, that's kind of the, your day-to-day -day life is like that. I think you can you can classify two delivery cycles models, right? One is waterfall when you deliver everything in it uh, in in one after another way, so to say. So you design your requirements, you build your code, you test your code, you deliver it to production. It has its own benefits and drawbacks, uh, and you have agile, which is opposite of waterfall, and it's a bit of a grayscale between them two. But um, Agile is about delivering code uh, more often and testing it more often. So everyone around can see what's going on and adjust it. That's why it's Agile, because you can make changes to what's going on on the project much quicker. Uh, and that was a big problem for pro project, IT projects in the past, because they would invest millions of pounds into a waterfall project and then realize at the end of it that it's not what they wanted while Agile helps to deliver things faster. And there is a set of ceremonies and roles that involve Agile to enable this process of continuous delivery. Um, and the principles just underline all that, but uh, Joe, I'm absolutely deeply respect to you for remembering uh, the, the manifesto. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit off the top of my head. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. I think it's definitely something that comes with experience uh, once you do get a role. And we have another question here saying, is there an overlap with a business analyst and a scrum master? You go, Joe. <laughs> not, I mean, um, I suppose not really. I mean, sorry, there's an overlap in that they work, they work closely together, but no, not there are, they're quite distinct roles. Um, so the sorts of things a BA might do, a lot of it's things like, um, requirement definition uh, and analysis and stuff like that whereas a scrum master i think as hannah kind of talked to a little bit earlier is much more of a coordinator um it's it's a role to be on it it's a it's quite a specific role in that it's actually a role that's only applicable to scrum which is a type of agile methodology um and yeah he or she is there essentially to facilitate the rest of the team's efficiency as it were um so he's there to try and prioritize things, remove blockers from the team's way, making sure that the agile principles of Scrum are being applied correctly. Um, yeah, so quite different roles actually. And, and he would typically be working with a team of mixed BA tester developer. Okay, so BA is probably one of the other roles you'd expect to have in the team. I have seen quite a few BAs um start off as a BA and then decide they want to switch into being a Scrum Master. I think the underlying personality types are probably quite similar. Um, but no, they are very distinct roles on a project. Well, they should be. If not, you'd be overworked.
No, thank you very much for answering that. Um, just whilst I'm seeing a lot of Code First questions in the chat here, I just want to say that there are a number of career switches, a switcher courses available. They may be location dependent. It's just because sometimes we have companies come in and sponsor and you might get a position at the company at the end. They are constantly being put out there. We're constantly getting new courses put up every sort of month or so. There will definitely be a new lot of courses in March, if not before then. Uh, so please keep looking at the website. There will definitely be something for you there. Um, the nano degree, the spring cohort has started, or it starts at the end of this month, so applications are closed. Um, but the summer cohort, I reckon applications will open April, May time for maybe a June, July start. I'm hoping to be teaching one of those, so maybe I will see you there. Um, but hopefully that helps. Keep checking the website. There will be something available at some point. We have a great team of people working on that in the background. If you do have any more questions for our people here at Deloitte, please put them in the chat. If I've missed any, please post them again. Or we have a huge number of comments now. Um, a question for myself if, to you all. What do you love about your job at Deloitte? How did you get here in your tech career? And what are you enjoying about the company you're working for now? We'll go to Anna. I'll start with you. <laughs> Oh, I already, I already spend so much time talking about what I enjoy about my job. I love ticking lists. That's that's my thing. I I like I love to do lists, and I have loads and loads of those basically where I tick off the lists endlessly about what I need to do, and that's what testing is a lot about. <laughs> You're like a lot of test scripts. You have a lot of defects, and then you tick the ticks off all day. So um, as I said, I, I love the fact that, and it's partially related to consulting as well. So it's more of a, not just testing, but consulting as well, because consulting gives you the ability to go to many industries, many clients, many projects. Um, I'm cross industry, which means that I, I work on financial industry, private, uh, I go to public sector and I deliver projects all across all different technologies as well. There is different combinations of everything. And every time you come in and every time it's like, oh, wow, this is so amazing. I have to learn everything from scratch because it's new data, new requirements, new everything, new technology. So it's very exciting and um, new people as well because every team, it's like, it, it's, a new, it's a new family, but um, it, it can be that way. We have a lot of very friendly people in Lloyd and um, it's, it's almost like, you're still within the same, so I'm talking more about consulting here than about testing, but as I already spoke about testing a lot, I'll talk a bit of consulting for a bit. So um, you, you change your project, it depends on the project lens, anything from, from few weeks to few years. And every time it's like you're changing either your career altogether or, or place of work, but you still kind of rooted back to your team as, uh, I am for quality and test engineering, so I still have my colleagues that I talk to and I refer back to. However, on my day-to-day -day basis, every year I might have a completely different team of new people who I talk to and, and made so many friends over the years uh, from clients' side, from uh, other suppliers, other, other providers that work for the clients. And um, within Deloitte as well, we have very, very big teams sometimes. Some projects can be in hundreds. And... Uh, um, Every time is something new. Uh, client changes, client offices change. You don't have to work at Deloitte office all the time. Now it's work from home time. Before it was a lot of uh, client side working. And um, that was lovely as well because we traveled a lot um, around around UK and the world. Uh, saw so many different ways of working as our clients do. Um, and testing just adds additional layer to all of that because you switch up the technologies and what you do every time, depending on what client needs to be done. Um, but yeah, that's 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 my take on it. Excellent, thank you. I think that's someone that's very passionate about their job, so I really love oh, that. Um, <laughs> Hannah, what about yourself? What do you love about your job and delight? Um, I'm, I guess, similar to Anna in that it's really exciting to be able to. Uh, learn new things all the time and change projects so I think I've worked across all the industries by now and um, been a part of things from um, 
NHS or um, a banking app or a um, a car seller, um, a car dealership, um, like all sorts of really random things along the way. But it has made it really interesting. And I feel like the skills that you acquire are like really varied. And it often means that you are given more responsibility because you have to, you're going onto a new client site and before you know it, you have to learn everything from scratch. And that's probably one of the things I like about it and what keeps it interesting and why I've been here for four years. Um, also for, for me in like a technical role, it's really handy that I'm always given time off to do training and certifications and um, and they pay for that which is obviously very nice. So that's something that I know that I wouldn't necessarily get in another job. Um, we aren't given like a budget of like, it's more, we're essentially allowed to do any training course that we want within reason. Like obviously, if you say you want to do a 50,000 pound random present presentation course and no, but if it's a, an AWS certification or a, um, I don't know, ITIL certification, whatever it may be, then that's cool with Deloitte. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Jill, anything you would like to add on your experience? <laughs> yeah, it's very similar themes. Um, I think probably the, the things that stick out for me in terms of what I like about certainly what, what I do and what we do, I think probably people would come first. I think, <clears throat> as Anna mentioned, like there's, there's a great selection of people that we get to work with. Um, I suppose I'm particularly talking about those within, within Deloitte. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly roll through colleagues depending on which project we're on and it changes up quite a lot um, but I've never not um, had a great team um, I think kind of second bit would be opportunities um, so both from a you know from an ability to improve yourself whether it be from like a training perspective and you know to what Hannah said the 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 catalog of training that we have is frankly exhausting to read like it's so like, there's so much in there um but then equally like also if there's type of work you'd like to do or like to follow you're always going to be able to do that you know regardless of what type of tech you're into or what type of industry so i think both both anna and hannah have worked across industries um i myself have actually gone down the route of specializing in wealth um like there's there's always going to be the types of roles on projects out there that will suit you um, and yes you might need to go out and chase them but they are there and people will back you um, to go after them um, and then I think the final thing which is really nice about joining a firm like De Deloitte is kind of the kind of the progression um, um, so you know there is there is a clear path and that there, there, there is always um, there is always like the next thing to aim for, I think, um, and you will find yourself progressing quite quickly. Um, we do have kind of quite regular um, promotions through our grades, so it's a really good um, place to kind of, you know, succeed and push on if that's something that motivates you. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. I hope that our audience is feeling inspired. I certainly am. It sounds like a great place to work. Yes, Anna. <laughs> I've seen a question that we missed. Someone was asking about a uh, tax background and what tax role we think would be the the best opportunity for them. Well, I, I already, as I found the question, I'll start answering it. Uh, I, I don't think that the background matters that much because um, especially tax will be useful wherever you go because we work with so many financial industry clients and so much of our work is related in there. So whatever you choose, it would be at a front end or back end developer, for example, you'll be developing, developing financial systems to hold uh, tax, tax functionalities. If you're a tester, you will be testing. Um, but you know what, at the end of the day, you don't have to. At the end of the day, you can just say, sick of tax, wanna do vacuum cleaners at Dyson. Wonderful, we have, we have a role for that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know so it doesn't matter but if that's something you want to pursue we we have something for you as well uh in the pocket um what's important about tax is that you have amazing uh attention for details because that's something that you go with to to, to do audit and tax you need accounting you need a lot of attention to, to the numbers 
and that is very useful in the testing industry because uh, we look for people who can spot even like decimal changes. Sorry. No, no, thank you for catching that. Uh, does anyone have anything to add before we wrap up? No, well, thank you Not very me. much to all three of you it's been an absolute pleasure to host you i hope you get some of these wonderful women uh, filing their applications through your door and uh, you'll see them all in the future and um, the code first please check out our courses they will always be refreshed every sort of month or so we've definitely got lots going on and there's lots in the pipeline but i want to say thank you to you all for attending thank you to our, our hosts for sharing their uh, insights and knowledge with you this evening it's definitely been eye-opening for me as well um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and we will see you soon at another MOOC or on one of our courses. Thanks very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye.